morning. Our scripture passage this morning, uh, we're going to start in Psalm 73 and then jump over to John chapter 6. Psalm 73, truly God is good to Israel for those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death, their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly you set them in slippery places, you make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. We're going to continue on in John chapter 6, starting in verse 5. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of, these, each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. Well, good morning as I get all set up here. How are we doing this morning? My name's... Uh, Josh, and uh, I'm excited to be here with you this morning. Um, just one second. Yeah, I'm excited to be here with you this morning. I feel like I got a good message from God, and I uh, uh, look forward to sharing you, uh, that with you. But yeah, I wanted to, uh, it kind of feels weird. You don't know me, and I don't know you, so uh, I just going to take a little bit of time. This has nothing to do with my sermon, but uh, make it short. But I feel like it's going to sound better if we know each other a little bit, right? So uh, I got a picture of my family. It's COVID kind of era, so you might not always get to see their beautiful faces, but that, that's the crew. Uh, they're back there in the corner. They'll be the ones that are rambunctious during the service, and that'll be okay. Uh, but yeah, uh, we moved to Canton from southern Indiana, and it's been interesting. It's been fun, and I'm excited about the work that God's going to do there. Um, we're certainly going to talk to you about that later in the service, but I'm just a simple guy. I come from simple roots, started out as a carpenter, and here I am speaking the Word of God to you fine folks. So that's it. That's enough about me, and today I, I want to talk with you about doubt, but in order to get to doubt, we got to start with sushi. 
That's the typical place you start, right? So from 15 years ago, 15 years ago, I didn't like this stuff. Uh, not that I'd ever tried it. Uh, I just knew I didn't like it. You know, raw fish and all that weird stuff, you know. Who, you know, looking at that, I'm thinking, like, who could like something that, that looks like that, you know. Besides, my friends had told me that it wasn't any good. And come to think of it, I don't know if they ever tried it either, but that was enough for me to make my position on sushi. But then I met my wife, Michelle. And man, she's uh, beautiful and brown and the best thing that ever happened to me. And, you know, that's just a testament that God can still work miracles right there. So, but yes, um, Michelle loved this stuff. And because I was smitten with her, um, I, I had a conflict between my position and her perspective on sushi. So I had a decision to make. I could either stay stuck in my unlightened position and prove to Michelle how boring I was, or I could try to experience something new and possibly learn something in the process. So being the gentleman that I was, I took her to her favorite spot. And I'm not even proud of that, guys. Like, I, I mean, I wasn't looking forward to it at all. We just kind of went in. And, uh, but to my surprise, other than trying to grab these little circular slimy things with these tiny little sticks, it was actually really good. And because I was willing to uh, process, I learned that my position was wrong. And for all those years, I was so unwilling to process my doubts about sushi, so I was left uh, without a better perspective. So until Michelle came along into my life, she saved me. She rescued me and made sure I didn't waste my doubts. So that's what I want to talk with us to uh, talk to you today about is uh, our common problem we all have with doubt, right? And I want to encourage you with my sermon titled uh, called Don't Waste It. Don't Waste It. So our passage, uh, our first passage that we read today talks about Asaph, right? And he's, uh, he's struggling with doubts. And his doubts, not the less critical kind like uh, a food preference, it's the more foundational kind like how to understand life. And uh, doubt's something common to us all. To be human is to doubt. But uh, it occurs like, you know, and you know this, doubt occurs when there's a tension between what we believe to be true and our, actually, our, our actual experience in light of that truth. And it can be paralyzing, uh, a doubt of that kind, often really painful because you get stuck in the middle and you're unsure how to process. Like you've been stuck in the middle, right? Like uh, knowing you can get 100 likes on Facebook, but probably not have one soul give a darn when you actually need some kind of help in life. Like uh, maybe raising your kids and trying to do your best to, to give them all the things you would want for them, but kind of feeling like you're failing them. Uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, trying to understand the coronavirus and everything that goes with it, yet everyone telling you how wrong that you have it. You know, maybe it's uh, being single in here, and you're enjoying that, but you uh, wonder about if you're wanted. Or maybe years ago you said, I do, to the person sitting next to you, but right now you're kind of feeling like I don't. So we get stuck, right? We get stuck. And that's okay, but the problem is when we refuse to process our doubt and just land there in the middle. So there's no... There's no equation to eliminate doubt. I'm not here to provide you with one. There's often no simple answers to that. But I think if we can expose kind of the elements that are happening when we doubt, I think we can provide some momentum so you don't have to waste your doubt. And so the first one is uh, we're all prisoners of our own positions. We are all prisoners of our own positions. See, we see life more as we are than it actually is. I know that shocked you I would say something profound like that, so let me say it again because it's important. We all see life more as we are than it actually is. And see, that's your vantage point, right? Like a child sees things differently than an adult does. An employee sees things differently than a boss does. If racism looks like a problem depends on what color of skin 
you are. I mean, suggesting what Baker Mayfield should have done on Sunday looks different than being Baker Mayfield running for your life on the field, right? Same issues, different positions. Are you with me? So uh, our positions, they're unique to us, right? They're the sum total of how we were raised. You know, what kind of family unit you were brought in, what town you were born in, the experiences that happened to you, the things you allow to influence you. And I'm not saying that these things are uh, untrue. It's just uh, they're incomplete. It's like we look at life like, like a, life's a great big picture, right? But we're only able to see a small part of that. And so Asaph, that's what's happening. Asaph is following God, yet he's struggling in life. And he sees people that are not, and they seem to be living high on the hog. And so he had every reason to doubt. Uh, For those that know scripture, if you turn to Psalms 1, David pens these words that people who follow God are like like, uh, trees planted by streams of water that yield fruit in season and leaves who do not wither. Whatever they do prospers. And that's an amazing truth that Asaph knows, but when it conflicts with what he experiences in reality, uh, it causes him to doubt. And the same thing happens to us, right? Because it's easy to have a position on something when you're not currently in it, right? That's happened to you before. Or, or for us Christians, you know, it's easy to quote Scripture and all the truth of God, but when life works out a different way and it starts to rock and it's hard to try to reconcile that difference. And see, uh, the primary reason, uh, if that wasn't bad enough about our doubt, to be prisoners by our position, it's how we view doubt. See, to us, you know, if I asked you about doubt, you would say doubt's bad. It's it's uh, something we should avoid. And that's what Asaph does, right? You were reading in there. He doesn't, he doesn't tell a soul, right? And so generally speaking, come on, let's track with me. Generally speaking, we are all very, very, very comfortable trying to take our position and get someone else to understand said position. Whatever it is, whatever you're pro this and anti this, doesn't matter. You will come to somebody and say, um, yeah, you should do this. And we think it's logical. We think it's reasonable. And matter of fact, if they don't, uh, you know, it's very unreasonable. It's very childlike not to even process, right? But when the shoe is on the other foot and they're asking you to do the same thing, well, oh, man, we just get so uncomfortable, right? We start squirming. It's like we say back home, it is no fun when the rabbit's got the gun, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. More southern slang. That works, babe. So i uh, got to remember to work that in there. So, and so for Christians, right, this even gets worse because we view doubt as uh, the opposite of faith, the, little po- the literal poison of faith because the more certain you are, the better off your faith is, and the more you have questions, the weaker your faith is. And that's why, uh, you know, uh, we label people like, Jesus, one of Jesus' disciples, got to slow down, disciples, uh, Thomas. What do we call Thomas? Doubting Thomas, right? Is it in the Bible? Nowhere in the Bible is it. Not only uh, does Jesus not chastise, well, hold on a minute. Why do we call him Doubting Thomas, right? Because he had a defect with his faith for not being able to see what the other 11 got to see, right? He didn't get to see the resurrected Jesus. He just got told about it. But not only does Jesus not chastise Thomas for not, for for that doubt, but he shows up and gives him his own personal visitation and encourages him. And I think, uh, you know, in Christian circles, and I'm not saying it's present here, but in in, in my experience in Christian circles, uh, this creates a culture where questions are not welcome. And we wonder why none of the young people want to come in here uh, because they, don't, they have no room to answer their questions, so they can go to Google, they can go to Facebook, because that's a place that's willing to wrestle with the hard things in life. And that's a shame, folks. I want the, we should want our young kids bringing their questions to us. And this is perplexing to me. It should be perplex, perplexing to you, so think about this. Before you started following Jesus, before you made God the center of your life, you were asked to question your current position weren't you? And we think that's a good thing. We talk about it every, every Sunday, right? Don't we? Question your current position. But then all of a sudden, after you believe, it becomes a bad thing. I mean, what was good on one side becomes bad on the other. And I think this happens, in my humble opinion, it's because we tend not to understand the difference between 
doubting God and doubting what we believe about God. Has the one, 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 am I moving too much? I'm getting excited. Sorry. So we, let me back up. So we tend not to understand the difference between doubting God and doubting what we believe about God. And see, one has the difference. One can be destructive to your faith, but the other has the power to enrich and refine your faith. Let me say this before you think John brought a heretic to your church to preach to you. While God can be known, and he has made himself known most personally through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the depths of what we can know about him have yet to be exhausted, have yet to be exhausted. And so when we only care about certainty, when we only care about this fixed position, we lose all the beauty of the mystery of our great big God. And so I'm here to tell you deep faith is about progress in a relationship with our Lord and our Savior and not about perfection, having it all figured out in this mental construct. And I say all that because why we view doubt this way, why, why we understand doubt as something bad, God doesn't tend to understand it like that. Uh, we have to realize when we read Psalm 73 that we're reading what you believe here, that this is the inspired word of God. It's God breathed. God orchestrated this thing. And so it's like, it's like one man said, uh, the words of doubting people become God's words to people doubting God. Let me say that again because you're just looking at me. The words of people doubting God become God's words. I messed that up. I wrote it down so I wouldn't mess it up. So, yes, the words of people doubting God becomes God's words to doubting people. Woo! You know, God in his wisdom, God in his wisdom, when he was trying to collect this, this scripture, said, hey, you know, we got to put this kind of stuff in there. And why did he do that? Because we need room to grow. We need room to uh, uh you know, he knew that following him, things would be difficult to understand about him, about our faith. And, and so we put this stuff in here. In fact, when we read through this scripture, right, we, uh, we see people going toe to toe and wrestling with God. And God honors that effort. He honors it. Uh, Asaph, in our passage here today, he's, you probably don't know who Asaph is, but he's the head temple musician. David appointed him to lead worship for the entire nation. He would become the clan of all future uh, musicians at the temple, and here he is on the mat wrestling God, going toe-to-toe with him and shooting him straight. And God's not only okay with that, he uses it to move them closer. And so now the, the second passage, let me, let me bring this in here because you're wondering why we read it. So the feeding of the 5,000, right? You've all heard that story. And, and, and we pick up the story, and Jesus has got this hungry crowd on his hands, right? And so what does the passage say? It says, knowing what he already had in mind to do, he creates this teaching moment for his disciples. Check this out. And so he's like in the Josh Hibber translation, feed these people, Right? And so, what is he? He's posing a question, and he's inviting doubt to enter their mind. He's not shielding them from doubt. He's actually creating it for them. Why? Uh, I think he needs them to learn. He needs them to grow. He needs them to process, and that only comes when we wrestle with doubt about our current position. If you've heard me say nothing more at this point, hear me say this. Doubt is not, doubt is the natural response to the limitation of our knowledge. It is not spiritual collapse. It's us screaming out for substance and truth. And guess what? That's what Jesus is. That what, that's what he came to supply. And he supplies it to us as we process, which is the second element I want to talk to you about. How we process matters. 
So we aren't given much insight uh, into how ASAP processes, right? Um, what does it say there, verse 15? Uh, you know, my Josh Haber translation again. You know, if I'd have spoken like, out like that, I would have ruined it for everybody, right? Then in 16, he goes on to say, the more he tried to understand this, it just troubled him deeply, right? But then it says, I went to God's sanctuary. And so I have no idea what happened there, who he ran into, what the sermon was on the day, uh, what songs were sung, but we know he took his position to a, pl- to a source of truth. So I want to jump back to, to the John story, because I think this is going to provide us more insight about process. So when I see this thing, I see three, three responses uh, pr- process responses I want to highlight very quickly for you. And the first was from Philip, right? Philip responds, he looks out at the crowd and like, man, there's way too many people here, uh, you know, take too much money to feed him, right? And I call this the cowardly lion response, right? You've seen the Wizard of Oz, right? And the, and the, and the, and the lion, he, he don't have no courage, right? So he just closes his eyes and he's just faking it till he makes it, right? I do believe, I do believe, I do, I do, I do, I do believe, right? Did I nail it? No? Okay. Uh, the cowardly. So, so what does he do? He's refusing, he's refusing to deal with his reality and just staying, just, just staying stuck in his own position. He, uh, he's avoiding any other options, and this is what happens when we do this. We avoid any other options and just think we got to, like, believe harder. we got to, like, manufacture more faith inside of us, and then that'll be what happens to, uh, to reach the intended goal uh, that we're after. And this happened, this is common. It happens a lot of times because a lot of people think, oh, I didn't get that healing because my faith wasn't strong. I didn't land that job. This relationship didn't work out because something is wrong with me. I just got to believe a little bit harder. I got to excuse that doubt in my mind. That, that, that's my problem. The second one is Andrew, right? Andrew, uh, Andrew sees this boy. He's brought this little sack lunch, right? But then he makes excuses like, that doesn't, that doesn't look like enough. And I call this the Chicken Little response. Uh, so Chicken Little, if it's been a while for some of you, uh, you remember he gets hit in the head, and instead of being rational to try to figure that out, he just goes around screaming, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, right? And while this one could be nuanced, let me say, this gets amplified a lot more the more foundational our belief is, right? Because when something's foundational, you're trying to protect that, that belief. And so, so we often get defensive, oftentimes angry, And uh, what this does, it creates a a learning phobia inside our mind where we can't handle any new information. Examples of this are just tons. Like when we figured out the earth wasn't flat, or that the sun was the actual center of the universe, or even when we actually read the Bible and it revealed to us that there's no way slavery could be in God's design. And this one was serious, y'all. I mean, like, blood was spilt over this. People lost their life. We murder people over protecting our position. And then the third one is the rest of the disciples, right? They, uh, they don't say nothing. They just kind of go with the flow. And I call this the Alice in Wonderland response. Hey, I got kids, a lot of Disney movies for these. So the Alice in Wonderland response. Remember Alice goes to the Cheshire cat and says, hey, you know, which way should I go? And he said, well, that all depends on where you're trying to get to. And she's like, well, I don't, it doesn't matter as long as I get somewhere, right? And that, this, it kind of happens to us when we just drift in any position because we have no grounding, right? So we're, we're willing to just chuck whatever we got when something comes into conflict, uh, com- comes in conflict with us because, uh, and then often we throw the baby out with the bathwater, Right? And this is what's happened in a lot of deconstructionist stories of faith that you hear about with prominent Christians and a lot of just normal, everyday people because they built their foundation on faith on something other than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. And I want to point one more thing out on, on these three. The common three objections to, uh, did I do three like that? Yeah, three. Uh, common three objections to Christianity, I mean, judge mind, judge, judgmental, anti-science, narrow-minded, I believe all stem from these three processes, responses. And so, 
bottom line, these all leave us stuck. They leave us hopeless for, un, for being able to understand our world and process it. And because we're unwilling to process, we just waste our doubt. But Jesus supplies a fourth option. He wants them to bring the meal to him, right? So much like Asaph, Jesus wants our doubt to come into conflict with the source of truth. And uh, the encouragement to you is that he's able to work with what we can give him, right? Whatever they had, he just gave it to him, and he can work with that. And, and through our willingness to engage with our doubts, God can give us a new perspective. But the problem is, for whether you're Christian in here or not, non-Christian, whether you believe or not, is we have a source of truth problem if our source of truth come from human positions, right? So we have a source of truth problem if your source of truth come from human positions, because then we're only left with CNN positions, or Fox News positions, or social media positions, or my best friend Billy's positions, or what mommy and daddy said positions, right? And you know this is a problem for you if you find there's only a small group of circle of, of, of people that you can talk to because everyone else aggravates you. Um, the, the, the thing is, uh, I'm not saying that what everybody says, you, I mean, you just got to blow it all off. There are certain, there is truth in, in any position that someone has, but you have to understand that they are primarily concerned with protecting their position, and so they're unable to lead us to that perspective, and perspective is what we want, which leads us to the last element that Gaining new perspective changes everything. So, I want you to notice a couple things about Asaph as, as uh, he gets done processing. One is, he never gets the answer to his question why the wicked seem to prosper and the righteous seem to suffer. The second thing is, uh, he, he finds that God was always with him, and the process actually moved them closer. There in verse 23 and 24, he says, he finds, I was always with you. You hold me. You guide me. You take me into your glory. And he realizes no matter what the wicked had, that having God was better. In the Josh Hibbert translation again in 25, he says, of all the things on heaven and earth, I desire nothing but you. But probably most of all, when he's looking at the end of the process there in verse 28, he finds, he says it was good. It was good. But as for me, it is good to be near God. See, he came in seeking just this little answer, but got way more than he bargained for. God gave him a new perspective, a bigger perspective. And in light of that, it took all the angst out of his doubt. And, and now it made him uh, agile enough and gave him more room to grow, right? And so, so Jesus echoes the same truth, right? Here, stay with me. We're, we're, coming, we're coming to the home stretch. So after everyone has had enough to eat, Jesus says, gather up the leftovers. Let nothing be wasted. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered up the baskets, and they were able to fill 12 baskets with the leftovers. Don't waste it. Jesus is concerned with the leftovers. And it begs the question, why? I mean, sure, in those days... Food was valuable, right? They didn't waste food. It's a, it's a practical concern. But everybody would have known that, right? They wouldn't have wasted it whether Jesus said that or not. So why does he say this? You know, I find it interesting, that word, it shows up earlier when Jesus is being questioned by some religious dudes, right? And when Jesus is trying to describe his followers, he, uh, he says that uh, you can't pour new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, uh, the skins, will, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the skins will be ruined. So new, new, wine, uh, new wine can't fit. New wine needs room to, to grow, to breathe, to process, right? It can't be shoved into these tight, constricting containers. And the, the same thing is true with us, right? Because we all show up to Jesus with positions, right? With old wineskins. But Jesus wants to give us new perspective, right? He wants to put new wine, so to speak, in your life. But in order to do that, he's, 
He's got it. We got to allow him to make us agile enough and flexible enough to give us the new perspective as he transforms us into new wineskins. And that's why I think there's exactly 12 baskets left over. You know, many smart dudes when I was studying would point to the theological connections, uh, the abundance of God, uh, the 12 baskets of the 12 disciples symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel. And I'm not disputing any of that, but maybe there's a more practical reason. And I think there's 12 baskets left over to provide 12 lessons about doubts to his disciples. One basket for each of them. You see, he needs this experience to mark them. He needs them to remember that what looks like not enough when placed in the hands of Jesus becomes more than enough. See, uh, for the rest of their time together, Jesus is going to need the disciples to expand their positions on a number of things. And he's only going to ask them harder questions from this point moving forward. And he needs in them to create some room to grow. Because these dudes and a lot of other people, um, they're going to come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, right? The promised one. But they have a position on what that Messiah is going to look like. You know, they're looking for this David-like conquering king to come in and overthrow the Roman oppressors and reestablish the kingdom of Israel. They're not looking for one that has this message of turn the other cheek and go the extra mile. They're looking for a king, this Messiah king that, uh, you know, uh, hang out with royalty and nobles, Not, not hang out with women and children who were kind of viewed as property of the time, not hang out with Samaritans and Gentiles, a.k.a. Uh, people of different skin color, not, especially not people that are, have problems, sicknesses, and diseases, and especially not sinners. I mean, messiahs and kings sit on thrones, not in tombs. And messiahs certainly don't let themselves get nailed to a Roman cross and crucified. So it doesn't look like much for the disciples on Friday, right? It doesn't look much for the disciples on Friday, uh, let me back that. They have these positions, right? And, and Jesus doesn't fit that. It doesn't look like enough. But Sunday's coming, right? On Sunday's coming, like their position on Friday doesn't look like much, but on Sunday it looks like more than enough. And so this is what that means. I mean, some of you are facing some stuff in here today, but you're going through it with a Friday type position. And God wants to speak into your life and give you a Sunday-type perspective. But guess what? Here's the magic of that. In order to get from Friday to Sunday, you got to spend some time in the tomb. you got to go through some processes. And that's uncomfortable for us because we don't like killing our positions, right? We don't like like admitting we were wrong. If I could speak to you from the bottom of my heart, (sighs) I'm a pastor, and I have my doubts, big doubts, doubts that force me to reach out to God about things, but I've learned in the process of my life to appreciate the doubts. Without those doubts, I would not be here today, because look, It was doubt that first brought me to God in the first place. It was through my doubts that he drew me closer to him, and I started experiencing this transformed life that's happening. It's it's through my doubts that, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, I decided to pack up my whole family and move to a town of Canton where everyone else seems to be wanting to get out. Not that I'm special. Uh, It has nothing to do with that I'm special. It's just because I was willing to process my doubts. And I'll be honest with you, it's a struggle in Canton. Everywhere I see, people say it's hopeless there, but it's through my processing my doubts that I remain hopeful because I get to see God be faithful and open doors again and again and again. But I couldn't get to that point 
if I wasted my doubt, stayed stuck in my position. So look, I don't, I don't know what it is that you're going through today. Uh, maybe everyone's not going through something, but it's coming for you, right? It's coming for you. And God wants to speak to you today in your situation, but he speaks to you in the middle, in that uncomfortable area as you process. And so my encouragement to you today, don't waste it. Don't waste it. Let me pray for us. Father God, We thank you for your word, and I don't know if I did any justice to it today, but I know there's real people in here with real situations going through some tough things, and I just pray over them that uh, they would know that you're not afraid of their questions, and that so they don't have to be either, Lord. I pray that uh, we wouldn't be afraid to run to you, Lord, with anything that comes on our mind, and as we approach others in a world that seems so against you, Lord, that that we invite them into process with you, that you're a big God and all we have to do is unlock your cage. Father God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.